this is beautiful. Okay, I like this lecture. This is a very, very <coughs> visual lecture. It's the art lecture, the, the revolution in art between the middle of the 19th century through to the middle of the 20th century. And we begin, not with an artist, but with a scientist. A Frenchman, Louis Daguerre. He's uh, born two years before the French Revolution. But he will revolutionize the world. The way we see the world. Does anybody know what this guy invented? Camera. The first camera. The dagger type from his last name, Daguerre. 1838. This changes everything in my mind. This is one of the first photographs. Street scene in Paris. You can actually see a guy getting his uh, boots shined there. Going all the way back to Giotto in the year 1300, artists had more or less tried to replicate what the eye sees. Now, there are some minor exceptions to that general rule, but that's basically art from the year 1300 right up to the middle of the 1800s, half a millennium. But I believe that photography, which becomes widespread by the 1850s, we have all those photographs by Matthew Brady of the Civil War in the 1860s. I think this changes the equation. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in the 1850s, also in France, art began to change. It began to change because of artists like Claude Monet. It's one of his first paintings, he's 16 years old, and it's arguably one of the first, if not the first, Impressionist painting. The Impressionists are so called because they paint their impressions of the world as opposed to trying to replicate what the eye sees. Here's a Monet from 1866. They also get out of the studio. They take their easels outside, gardens like this, seaside resorts like this, and they paint their impressions. Broad brush strokes. There's a, a deliberate lack of precision. Very beautiful paintings, usually. Uh, impressionism uh, pops up in pediatricians' waiting rooms and dorm rooms, very beautiful stuff. Broad brush strokes, outdoors, pastels, these are all Monet paintings. He paints hundreds of paintings. He's incredibly prolific over a very, very long career. And really for the first time then, artists were not trying to replicate exactly what the eye sees. For the first time, I would argue, in 500 years, if not more. Yes, sir? Is this a result of the camera being able to do that for them? I think it is. I'm not an art historian, but I, I think it can't be a coincidence that photography comes of age in the 1850s and impressionists show up in the 1850s. I think there has to be a correlation. I don't think it's a coincidence. The Impressionists break the mold. In the 1880s, though, it's another big change. Expressionists. Sounds a lot like Impressionists, but it's very different. The first expressionist is generally understood to be this guy right here. This is a self-portrait. He does a lot of self-portraits. It's Vincent van Gogh. He is Dutch. He is deeply troubled, deeply unhappy. Suffers from debilitating depression. 
Of course, he lives in an age before Sigmund Freud, before psychotherapy, and obviously before uh, pharmacological solutions to depression. He begins his artistic career painting in a kind of impressionist style. Here's a nice flower field in his native Holland. But it doesn't look like Monet. It doesn't look like Renoir or Manet or Pizarro. There's a certain darkness to it. It's tough to put your finger on, but it doesn't feel as bucolic as a Monet paint. As he becomes older, slides further and further into the depths of depression, his style changes. It begins to move away from the Impressionist school, it becomes something very different. He, uh, he spends a lot of time in the new world of nightlife. Gas lamps and then electric lamps had really, for the first time in human history, opened up the night. And so this is a painting of the night cafe with some rather sad souls huddled on these tables, depressed like Vincent. He paints nature, but in a rather disturbed way. If Monet painted a, a group of olive trees, it would be very beautiful and it would be very nice and bucolic. This is a kind of tortured hellscape of these undulating lines. Very unsettling painting. But perhaps the most famous painting, which does show up in Dorf, it's often called very beautiful, is 1889's Starry Night. This view, some people have argued, is the view he had while he was staying at an insane asylum. The tortured lines in the night sky here are an expression of his inner turmoil, his inner angst, his inner sadness. A sadness and a depression that in 1890 would come to a Fatal end. On a Sunday morning, the 27th of July, 1890, Vincent, as usual, took his paint box, easel, and brushes and walked up this road to the nearby fields. He was also carrying a gun. He was about to make a decision. Regardless of our moral reaction to his act, it must be recognized as a deliberate choice. After lying unconscious all day in the hot sun, he managed to stagger back to the cafe. What occurred in the last hours of his life most clearly indicates that he was not mad, but obviously a man afflicted with a physical problem which drove him to a desperate act. His brother received the news the next day and came immediately.
it seemed as though he was determined to succeed in his own death. He said, I've been a failure at so many things in my lifetime. I hope I haven't failed at this as well. TV score at home, yes, that was Leonard Nimoy with a mustache from his 1970s series In Search Of. Uh, Vincent will die from his self-inflicted gunshot wound, and his statement about being a failure is very true. Never sold a painting while he was alive. Today, well, over the last 50 years on the art market and the auction houses, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent acquiring his painting. But when he was alive, not a one. Yes? So, he shot himself, like, trying to commit suicide, but he failed and then he died later? Or? He died of the wound. He didn't okay. die immediately. He managed to, like, miss... <laughs> Okay. So, so he kind of screwed up his own suicide. When did he cut off his ear, though? Oh, uh, earlier. Earlier? Okay. Yes. Yes. I had taken an art history class in high school, and I, I thought he decided not to sell the paintings. Um, it's an interesting question. Does he decide not to sell, or does is he unable to sell? Um, I am not an expert on I would defer to your art history class. Uh, what we can say, though, is that no paintings are sold. Um, whether it's intentional, whether it's the market not wanting it, uh, I don't know for certain. Um, it is, it's one of those great tragedies that someone who becomes one of the most famous artists of the modern era um, dies believing that he is a nobody, penniless, and almost screws up his own suicide. To the very tragic figure, suffered from very deep depression, but of course, no diagnosis for depression here in the 19th century. Someone else who suffered greatly from depression is a Norwegian artist named Edvard Molk. He's also an expressionist very different kind of expressionist. Expressionism, there is no expressionist style. What we can say about expressionism is that the artist is on the canvas expressing their often inner turmoil and their emotions. This is a self-portrait done by Munch. He lives a long life, but a life that is seemingly very unhappy. When he is a uh, a child, one of his favorite sisters, dies. I believe that this painting here is inspired by that loss, death in the sick room. Very different stylistically from Vincent van Gogh. But the paintings come from a similar tortured psyche. When he's five years old, just five years old, his mother dies. This painting, I believe, is a reflection of that loss. This is not a painting you would have in the waiting room of a pediatrician's office. Uh, this is not a comforting painting. This is a deeply unsettling painting. The dead mother. This haunting child with the piercing eyes. Uh, unsettling is Edvard Munch, but you've probably almost undoubtedly not seen The Dead Mother, The Self-Portrait, Death in the Sick Room, but I do guarantee you've seen this painting. First painted in 1893, it's a subject that he is obsessed with. He will paint this scene over and over and over again. Munch was only 29 when he painted the screen, but he was already burdened with tragedy and loss. His Oslo childhood had been deeply unhappy from the moment his mother died when he was five. His father, Terrorized the 
like children, taking every word of the Bible as literal truth and convincing his offspring that any misbehavior condemned them to everlasting flames. Sickness and insanity and death were the black angels that hovered over my cradle and have since followed me throughout my life. At an early age, I was taught about the perils and the miseries of life on this earth, about life after death, and also about the agonies of hell that lay in store for children who sinned. Monk survived, but he saw his sisters and brother slowly deteriorate around him. His favorite sister, Sophie, died when he was 14, and Laura was diagnosed with melancholia. Monk himself suffered prolonged bouts of sickness and depression. The original version of Scream is the one from 1893 hanging here in the International Gallery in Oslo. Five of them are paintings. I feel that you can talk about two original versions of, of the Scream, at least. There are several versions. I mean, there is one in the Monk Museum. A hundred versions of them are prints. And then you have two pastels. These are, I feel, the 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 the, the screen. Our version of the screen uh, is well, it's a sketch. It must be the original one. Yes, there's a choice of screens, a rich field for scholars and evidence of Edvard Munch's obsession. The idea behind the painting consumed him, and he endlessly reworked it and copied it. People screaming had been included in pictures before, but he painted the bare fact of a scream. That was new. The very idea of painting a scream is an amazingly paradoxical idea. I mean, here is a painting. A painting is silent by definition. It's a painting which is supposed to emit a sound. But who or what is screaming? At first sight, a silly question. Surely it's a tortured figure crying out in anguish. But that wasn't the notion that obsessed Monk. I was walking along a road with two friends. The sun set. I felt a tinge of melancholy. Suddenly, the sky became a bloody red. I stopped, leaned against the railing, dead tired, and I looked at the flaming clouds that hung like blood and a sword over the blue-black field and the city. My friends walked on. I stood there trembling with fright, and I felt a loud, unending scream piercing nature. In recreating that feeling, Monk places it at the very spot where he experienced it. The landscape behind the figure is not at all imaginary. It's the actual site in Oslo, then known as Christiania, where that terrible feeling overtook him. In fact, the background landscape is loaded with meaning. For one thing, this is a famous spot in Oslo, the traditional vantage point for artists to portray the city. To Monk, it was a very personal painting. I mean, it was his experience. I mean, he had this experience of angst or fear right there in the outskirts of, of Christiania. And even in the, the most simplified versions, like in the lithography and even in some drawings, you always have these basic geographic uh, images there, you know, to say, well, this is my experience right there. Monk includes recognizable landmarks in the painting, the fjord and the old Arca church, locating us firmly at a known point on the map. It is a place to which every Norwegian had some sort of a relationship. What Monk did was, so to say, to project his feeling. He showed in his painting how his art it converted, changed the spot into an experience of angst. The figure seems to be standing on a bridge or a pier, but it's actually an old road out of the city, skirting a steep cliff known as Eckerberg. For Monk, this place vibrated with painful memories. It was 
a scruffy spot on the wrong side of Oslo and the scene of many suicides. In 1893, one of Munch's close friends, Kalle Lurken, an actor, shot himself in the woods just below. Also here is the Oslo Hospital, then used as an asylum for women. At the very time Monk began working on his screen paintings, his beloved sister Laura was hospitalized in Oslo, suffering from manic depression. It was said that from this spot, you could hear the shrieks of the insane women. For good measure, there were also slaughterhouses nearby at the base of the cliff, another source for the shrill sounds Monk might have recalled. That day, as he walked with his friends, all the sorrow in his life had overwhelmed him. A beautiful sunset sickened into something dizzying and frightful. The music that I've been playing in the background, the Van Gogh and Munch series of paintings, is by two radical composers. One uh, Austrian, Arnold Schoenberg, and one uh, Hungarian, Bela Bartok. This isn't Beethoven, this isn't Mozart, this isn't Bach or Haydn. This is atonal, it's arrhythmic, it's unsettling. It's very much a product of the early 20th century, when everything was changing telephones, to air travel, to steamships, to automobiles, everything had changed. And a lot of people felt very dislocated. People like Edvard Munch, very out of place in this brave new world. And so this music being produced by the likes of Schoenberg and Bartok is very much a reflection of this dislocation, the social dislocation, cultural dislocation as a result of the industrial revolution. It's not fun music. It's very unsettling music. Yes, sir? What is it called? Atonal music? Well, atonal means it's it's um, it's not uh, harmonics. So it's <laughs> like that. Um, and then arrhythmic, it's, you know, Beethoven writes in 3, 4, 6, 8, or 4, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. This is all over the map. This is weird stuff. And it's very much a product, I would argue, of this, uh, this brave new world that we've been looking at over the course of these last few lectures. Down in Italy, we're moving around Europe. Austria and Hungary to now Italy, a group of poets, artists, composers labeled themselves futurists. And they were very much not feeling dislocated by this industrial change. They were celebrating. I think it's not surprising that this art movement is born in Italy. Italy is heavy with the weight of millennia of history. But in the early 20th century, it was still a largely unindustrialized country. For many respects, Italy really doesn't industrialize until after World War II. And these artists are striving for something that just doesn't exist in Italy. They'd much rather be in New York City. And in 1909, they drafted a manifesto. The music that you hear is a bit of futurist composition. Unsettling, hyper modern. The manifesto is a celebration of everything new and a denigration of everything old. We want to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and rashness. The essential elements of our poetry will be courage, audacity, revolt. We want to exalt movements of aggression, the slap and the blow with the fist. We declare that the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing automobile with its hood adorned 
with great tubes like serpents, with explosive breath that seems to run on machine gun fire, is more beautiful than the Mona Lisa. We are on the extreme promontory of the centuries. What is the use of looking behind? We want to glorify war, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of the anarchists. Anarchists are a big feature of the early 20th century. A lot of political assassinations are carried out by anarchists. The American president, McKinley, is assassinated by an anarchist at the turn of the 20th century. The, uh, the Italian king, Umberto, is assassinated by an anarchist. The beautiful ideas which kill and contempt for women. This is a very misogynistic movement. We want to demolish museums and libraries, fight morality and feminism, and all opportunist and utilitarian cowardice. It should come as no surprise that most of these futurists in the 1920s ended up being another ist, fascists. In Benito Mussolini, they believed they'd found a hero someone who understood their desire and embrace of change. Question? Um, the feminism um, plan there, um, could women start voting in 1909? Is that the No. Uh, but there was agitation for yeah. the right of women to vote, um, going all the way back in this country to the middle of the 19th is just, century. Is it just the United States that women would vote, or is it the United States? Well, women get to vote in 1920. Uh, women in England get the vote in the 20s. I don't know the exact date. I'm not sure when it happens in Italy. Okay. Uh, it could be a little bit later. But there was uh, a, a suffragette movement, as it's known, to grant women the right to vote. And, and these men, they're all men, uh, are a, very misogynistic, uh, very chauvinistic, and they all end up being fascists. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're a lovely group of people. Uh, the, the futurists, but they're very much of a time. They're a product of the Industrial Revolution. At about the same time, the futurists are writing their uh, misogynistic manifesto down in Italy. Up in Paris, a Spanish artist will rewrite the rule book, will go so far beyond Impressionism, Impressionism into the world of abstract art, into what we call cubism. He's a Spaniard named Pablo Picasso, arguably one of the most famous artists of the modern era, very prolific, and in 1907, age of 26, he paints a radical canvas. The Young Women of Avignon, in French, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. It's the first step on the road to abstract art. If the Impressionists had begun to move away from naturalistic and realistic depictions, what Picasso does with Cubism is take that movement to its logical extreme, which is completely non-representational. Art. And it begins here in 1907 with La Demoiselle. In March 1907, Picasso bought two primitive Spanish carvings. He later said he felt the figures gained a mystical power over him. Picasso felt a spirit awakening him, like a message from the ancient world, and it would permanently reshape his art. Now he isolated himself in his studio. He had an idea for a painting unlike anything anyone had ever done before. For his subject, Picasso drew on the brothels he visited as a young man. He had to hunker down and come up with something really shocking, really progressive, really iconoclastic. He worked on it in the spring and summer. It was a very hot summer. So you just have to think of Picasso in this cellar, in this ramshackle building stark naked with these women who were tall, much taller than himself, painting away at this, his own terrible, hellish whorehouse in order to tap himself into the great revolutionary breakthrough painter. 
He had recently been to see the new collection of African art at the Trocadero Museum. The simple forcefulness of these figures inspired him to make something equally rough and raw. So like a shame, Picasso summoned these ancient spirits. He distorted faces, simplified lines, and twisted shapes. And in this painting, which came to be known as Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, Picasso sought to forge a link between tribal art and modern art. Picasso drew on his personal experiences from the brothels of Barcelona to his now faltering relationship with Fernand. And he created a sort of primitive icon of the terror posed to man by women. Picasso saw women as closer to the secrets of the universe than men, and immensely dangerous. He had immensely deep reactions to women. He, he adored them, and, then the, and he also detested them. Picasso never expected the conservative French public to understand Les Demoiselles. He felt certain, however, that his friends, the painters and poets of the avant-garde, would appreciate it. But one by one, they came and stood before the painting in horrified silence. Even his artist friends didn't understand it at all. It was obviously so different from what people thought was beautiful, desirable, understandable. It's hard to explain now uh, how extraordinarily different it looked because we are all used to seeing so many reproductions. But at the time, I think it was just totally incomprehensible. Picasso's fellow painter, André Durand, predicted his humiliation would be so great it would lead to suicide. Picasso would be found hanging behind the canvas. Even his most loyal patron, Leo Stein, called the painting a horrible mess. Not well received, initially. But Picasso is undeterred and begins moving more towards an abstract, non-representational art. More towards this figure than this figure. And in 1910, he produces Nude woman, we are so far beyond the pale at this point. This is non-representational, this is abstract, this is cubist art. This is radically different than anything that's come before. In 1911, the accordionist. These are very controversial works, a lot of people had a very uh, visceral, negative reaction to Cubist art. Because it doesn't, quote, look like anything. Art has changed radically in just a half century since the Impressionists began working. And this style, which is pioneered by Picasso in Paris, will be picked up in the Netherlands by two Dutch artists. One a painter, Piet Wondrian, and one an architect, Gerrit Rietveld. And they will adapt cubism into what the Dutch call de stijl, which literally means the style. Piet Mondrian will be taken with this cubist, rectilinear, abstract art. And in 1913, six years after the Demoiselle d'Avignon, he paints the creatively titled Composition Number Two. Completely abstract. Completely non-representational. How about Composition A? from 1920. He really begins to establish a style of primary colors, yellows, blues, reds, and right angles. I actually like Mondrian quite a bit. A lot of people despise him. They'll say things like, well, I could do that. I couldn't paint the Sistine Chapel, but give me a weekend and I could do Composition A. Maybe, but you didn't. He did. 
Let's take a poll. How many people like this painting? Raise your hand. One, two, three. How many people don't like it? One, two, three, and four abstentions. <laughs> it's controversial. It arouses uh, some, some, some passions in people, both positive and negative. How about 1922's very stark, mostly white composition with blue, yellow, black, red? There's the red. There's the yellow, blue, black. Plus an empty canvas. This is uh, a radically different world of art than we have had previously. Sir? Do you by any chance know how long it took him to like, make one of these? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I can trust it for that. I don't know. Why don't you ask the internet? <laughs> um, people either love this stuff or they hate this stuff. Uh, there's really no uh, kind of uh, middle of the road. So what Mondrian is doing on the canvas, his fellow De Steel artist, Garrett Rietfeld, is doing in architecture. In the city of Utrecht, in the Netherlands, almost 90 years ago, he will essentially make a Mondrian painting in three dimensions for his wealthy patron, the widow Schroeder. But here in the Netherlands, there's a house that turns all of them upside down. And even more strangely, it was built nearly 19 years ago. This is the Rietveld Schroeder House in Utrecht, built in 1924 and now a museum. It's one of my favorite buildings, a perfect blueprint for a home, full of light, space and personality. Things that were really important to Rietveld were, for example, how you can connect the inside with the outside. He always experiments with space. He put in just enough walls to keep the whole together, to make it solid enough to become a house. It almost becomes a three-dimensional Mondrian painting. What's this over here? What's, what does booze shuffle mean? It's grocery or messages. This is, it's a speaking tube. Oh, like an intercom. Yeah. Like to you can see it. someone's at home. Hello, is anybody in? That's very nifty. Oh, open sesame. Wow, my goodness, look at this. Wow, it's so light and spacious. And also open plan as well. That must have been quite a radical idea. Yeah, this, is what, this is what you get when you make a floor without any walls. So here you see the setup at daytime. This is the center of the house, okay. the vibrant heart of the house. And is this, the, um, is this where the, the intercom ends up? Yeah, this is the speaking uh, tube. So it's going to show you standing here. Hello, is anybody in? No, not at all. <laughs> this is really, really special. There is just enough wall to keep this house together. Yeah. The rest is glass. Oh, incredible, not only is it a house without walls, it's a house without corners as well. This sums up what Rietveld really wanted to do. He doesn't make fixed corners. He lets space go through, and here you see it literally no corner at all. Famous chair. This chair was the starting point of the house. You can see a lot of similarities. The distel colors, the primary colors, the use of the color. Okay. The back is red. Where you sit, it's blue, and then they use the yellow to show us that the elements go through space. What he did here, what I explained at the window, is that he doesn't make a fixed corner. He just let the, all the elements mm -hmm. go straight into space. This whole new way of thinking about a chair as being an object in space was revolutionary. Root Bell wanted the house to be open plan during the day. That's great, a house without walls suddenly get walls. But to be private and enclosed at night. Ingeniously, the house flexibly adapts to the family's changing needs. It becomes so dynamic, doesn't it? It becomes so, the whole space seems to sort of come alive and move. That building becomes like a performance, doesn't it? 
It's almost like a, a kind of child's box of tricks somehow, like that idea that the individual can live here and completely transform it, you know, completely transform how they live in the house. The house liberates them. It's so clever. It makes me so angry and so annoyed that we don't live in these kind of clever houses now. Why, why don't we? Why do we live in these big, lumpy, great boxes where we could be living in something that's light and transformable and, and beautiful too? So while Rietveld is working in the Netherlands, down in Germany, a similar aesthetic is taking hold. In 1919, Walter Gropius found the Bauhaus Art and Architecture School. As we're going to see, Germany in 1919 is not a happy place. The war is over, Germany has lost, and Germany has been saddled with the complete blame for the war. And so Gropius and the people who come to Bauhaus are looking for a fresh start. And that fresh start is, is embodied in the building itself. Clean lines, no ornamentation, no decoration. The motto of the Bauhaus is less is more. And some of the greatest architects in Europe will come to the Bauhaus to work. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and the Frenchman Le Corbusier. They will start a revolution in architecture that will change the way cities look in the 20th century. The modern skyscraper, glass and steel, rectilinear, is born here in Bauhaus in 1919 at the drawing boards of Gropius, Le Corbusier, and Mies van der Rohe. But they first start building domestic houses, not skyscrapers. And in 1927, Le Corbusier, outside of Paris, will build this expression of Bauhaus aesthetics, Villa Stein. White, no decoration, no ornamentation, rectilinear, a kind of cubist painting in architecture. To this day, it still looks quote-unquote modern and it's almost 90 years old. Also outside of Paris, Le Corbusier, for the exiled royal family of Italy, will build this, again, still strikingly modern house, the Villa Savoie. The Villa Savoie is considered by many to be the seminal work of the French architect Le Corbusier. Situated in Poissy outside of Paris, it's one of the most recognisable architectural presentations of the international style and remains as avant-garde today as it was at the time of its completion back in 1931. The house was emblematic of Le Corbusier's work as it addressed the five points his basic tenets of a new aesthetic of architecture constructed using reinforced concrete. Now this entailed stilts to create a box in the air, a flat roof terrace, an open plan design, horizontal windows, and a free floating facade. Originally designed as the weekend home of the Savoir family, the villa was never really occupied as Cabousier's flat roof leaked from day one. With the onset of World War II, it was occupied by the invading German army, then by the Allies, before falling into a state of disrepair. Today, however, it's a national historic monument and a living manifesto for modernism. This style is often called the international style because it transcends national borders. The Bauhaus begins in Germany, Le Corbusier is working here in France, and you can even go to the Czech Republic, at that time Czechoslovakia, to the Tugendhat house built by Mies van der Rohe. It still looks modern. 
it still looks as though it could have been built last week. If you go by, um, behind Kroger, there is a, uh, there's a, like a football field, soccer field. And then on past that, there's a white house on the corner. It's very much a Bauhaus international style house. It's rectilinear, it's white, it's unornamented, undecorated, a lot of glass, very much like the Villa Savoie, the Villa Stein, or the, the Tugendhat house. By the 1930s, things are changing in Europe, especially in Germany. Hitler despises the Bauhaus. Hitler views it as quote-unquote Jewish architecture. He likes classical Roman architecture. He hates this modern style. And so a lot of the Bauhaus architects like Mies van der Rohe, like Walter Gropius, will leave for the United States. Gropius settles uh, outside of Boston, builds himself this house for his family, embodying all of the international style Bauhaus techniques of horizontal windows, rectilinear, cubist lines, open spaces, no decoration. White uh, is the order of the day. Again, a house that was built in 1938, but still looks very much like a modern 21st century house, even. So Walter Gropius goes to Boston, Mies van der Rohe goes to Chicago. And south of the city, 90 miles south, he will build this house, this structure, for a wealthy Chicago doctor, Dr. Farnsworth. So let's, uh, for our last thing, take a tour here of the Farnsworth house, the kind of ultimate expression of the uh, international style in a domestic space. The Farnsworth House is one of only three single-family homes in the United States by renowned German architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Mies, as he's usually referred to, was already nearing legendary status when he fled Nazi Germany for the U.S. in 1938. A one-time director of the celebrated Bauhaus Architecture School, Mies is widely acknowledged as the founder of the glass and steel modernist style. Some 60 miles southwest of Chicago, the Farnsworth House is nestled along the banks of the Fox River in Plano, Illinois. A glass house. It would be a first, but why not? When you're inside, it's like you're outside because you're looking through the glass. And you're seeing these trees, and you're seeing the river, and you're seeing the sky. It's like... There's no separation. The entire structure is held up by just eight steel I-beams. A terrace extends from the west end, creating a link from the inside to the outside. So what's the philosophy behind this big, empty, open space? Less is more. Less intrusion inside. He was fascinated by spaces in which you could do just about anything. Its architecture reduced to its barest minimum. A steel-framed slab of concrete for the roof, a thin membrane of glass for the walls, and another slab of concrete covered in heated travertine marble for the floor. In the center, a core made of rare Primavera wood houses two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a utility room. A single tube containing all of the utilities descends from the home's center into the ground. And that's it. So let's take a snap poll. How many people would live in this house? I might. One, two, how many people would not like to live in the house? Too scary with how many windows. Out in the woods. 
Uh, the doctor hated it. She was, uh, she never really spent any time there, Dr. Farnsworth. Okay, so we've seen, uh, art and architecture change radically over the course of a century, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. And if you haven't done so already, do read the Peter Watson chapter called Volcano that will really help to, uh, help to tie all of this together. Uh, so have a nice spring break. We will review for the exam when we come back on Monday. Be safe out there. Uh, don't do anything too drastically uh, impulsive. So they steal or how do you just steal? That's the Cubism style that was brought over to uh, the Dutch. 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 Yeah.